Good morning and welcome to you all. I am Nompumelela Maduna, the current Miss Earth South Africa, and I'm so honored to be here today on behalf of BBC Studios and DSTV to host the launch of Sir David Attenborough's passion project, The Green Planet. Now, this landmark six-part series, including a making of episode, will premiere on BBC Earth DSTV channel 184 on Sunday, the 13th of February at 4 p.m. sharp. Now, what a better time to celebrate than the month of love as we all probably do love plants. I do hope so. Now, this series was made over the course of four years by BBC Studios' world-renowned Natural History Unit. The Green Planet follows Sir David as he travels across the globe to bring you the first immersive portrayal of an unseen, interconnected world full of remarkable new behavior and surprising heroes in the plant world. Now, these plants count, they hunt, they deceive, they communicate, they protect their relatives, and they manipulate animals for their own ends. Not only does the series reveal the fascinating world of plants, but it also highlights how dependent we are on them for survival. Airing at a critical time in history of our green planet, this series shines a light on plants as our greatest allies and unsung heroes. Now, before we introduce our guests and learn more about this um, exceptional landmark series and what to expect from it, I would first like to quickly go over some pieces of housekeeping. Please don't record or share the clips that we will show today. We want audiences to see the series in its full splendor and context. The team will share behind the, the scenes clips and images following the event. If you'd like to post your reaction to the series, please do so using the hashtag, hashtag the green planet. And finally, if you think you have any questions throughout the event, please share them in our Q&A box on the screen and we will ask our superb guests. Now let's get started. I am delighted to introduce our guests that have brought this brilliant series to our screens. Series producer Rupert Barrington and Rosie Thomas, who produced episode three, which is called Seasonal Worlds, which features South Africa. Welcome to you both. Good morning. Rupert, let's get straight into it. Now, the green planet. How did the idea come about for the series and what sets it apart from the previous BBC natural history series? Um, well, I think really we felt it was time to make a series on plants. The last series the natural history unit made was 25, maybe 26 years ago, which is David Attenborough's um, Private Life of Plants, which really introduced to the world the idea of filming plants in time lapse and seeing what they do. And since that time, we made many, many series on animals and shown people the amazing things that animals do. But we felt that people were becoming more and more aware of the importance of plants with the climate crisis. And we thought we could make a series which obviously talked about that, but also turn the time lapse cameras on again to this plant world with lots of new technology to show people what plants do and what plants are really like, which is very different to how you might imagine when you walk around in your daily life. That is true, definitely. We've started to appreciate plants more. And also, Rupert, you, you say, um, you see the program synopsis describes that the plant world is aggressive, competitive, and as dramatic as the animal kingdom. Can you please elaborate a bit more on that? Well, I think what, what we really wanted to get at with the series is that plants face all the same problems in their lives that animals do. An individual tree is trying, it wants space, it wants food, it wants to find a mate to reproduce to protect its young. So all these things that animals do, um, plants simply operate on a different time scale. But when you can see plants on their own time scale, when you can speed up their action, you see that they're incredibly dynamic. They're <coughs> um, inventive. They do extraordinary things to solve the challenges of life that animals also face. So there's a whole world around us, which we don't see, which is really dynamic and exciting. Absolutely. I can't wait to see the first clip. Ooh, we're getting closer to it. Can you also give us um, some examples of plants featured in the series and what makes them so unique? Um, well, I think there are so many different kinds of plants and so many different kinds of plant behavior. For example, in the first episode of the tropical film, there's a plant called Rafflesia, which is a parasitic plant. 
So it has no roots, uh, so, uh, no stem, it has no leaves. It's simply this great big bud for four or five years, which then produces a flower a meter across. Um, mm -hmm. And it lives where there are no natural pollinators like birds and bees, because all up in the rainforest canopy, and this plant lives on the rainforest floor. Um, so it pretends, it mimics um, the body of a dead animal. It smells like one, it looks like one, the texture is the same as a, a dead body, and that attracts flies, which lay their eggs on dead bodies. So the plant, as we find throughout the series, very often when there's an animal-plant interaction, the plant is actually in charge of that interaction, and it's controlling the animal world around it. Um, and there are so many examples like this, where you look at a plant and you think, I had no idea that a plant did that, and that in this interaction, the plant is either in charge or rather than being passive, it's fighting back. Hmm. Interesting. And uh, just as previously mentioned, um, Sir David, it is his passion project. How much was he involved in the making of the series and how frequently does he actually appear? Well, David was very involved. Um, over the last 10 years, he's really just turned up at the beginning and end of a series or beginning and end of a program to set things going and to round them off. He's really, as you say, it's a passion project. He's really, really into plants. And when we got this series commissioned, David said, finally, I've waited 25 years to be able to make another series on plants. Mm -hmm. um, so he said, I'm, I'm really up for doing a lot of traveling on the series, which I don't normally do. So we took into the deserts of um, the Southern US. We took into Costa Rica, the rainforest. We took into Europe to look at rivers and lakes. Um, Rosie took into the Arctic Circle in Finland. We took him all over the UK. And he turns up um, probably six, seven, eight times per episode to, to take you somewhere or to show you some amazing thing that an animal does or to trigger a plant, I'm sorry, or to trigger a plant to do something amazing. So he interacts with the plant world. And I think his, his passion and his interest in the plant world just shines through. So he's a brilliant guide into this slightly parallel world that we're showing. Hmm. Now, Rupert, you've shared quite a lot of detail about the plant world and Sir David's passion project. I think it's time for us to have a look at a clip from episode one, which is called Tropical Worlds. This is the seven hour flower. This plant produces its flowers at night. They open about six o'clock and each blossom only lasts that night. It opens for about seven hours and then it dies. But during that time, it provides food for one particular animal, a bat. And here it is. During the seven hour flowers flowering season, Underwood's bat feeds almost exclusively on its nectar. It is the plant's primary pollinator. It might seem that this is a fairly evenly balanced relationship, but not so. The bat likes this nectar because it's sweet but it's not very nourishing. So the bat must visit hundreds of flowers a night. And it pollinates them as it feeds. But if a patch of forest becomes too small, with too few flowers, the bats will disappear. And without the bats, the flowers can't reproduce and will soon die out. The partnership is broken. Life in the forest depends on countless close relationships, but they are increasingly under threat as forests become more fragmented. The solution, of course, is to join these remaining fragments together. Now, I'm sure you can all agree the detail is impeccable, and that's just a snippet.
I'm just saying. Now the sequences captured are so impressive and feature so many different countries. Can you give us an understanding of the planning, the contributions that lie behind a production like this? I mean, the crew time, the hours, the location that you had to shoot at. I think that's one for Rosie probably. <laughs> Um, oh, I, I mean, I'm not sure actually the number of people, there were so many people across the world involved in the making of the series. I mean, I would say hun hundreds of people um, in, well, I think, did we film in about 32 different countries, Rupert? I can't yeah, remember. Yeah. yeah, about 32 different countries for, across the series. Uh, on the Seasonal Worlds episode alone, I think we did 51 different shoots in order to capture all the footage for that one show um especially because it was seasonal worlds we had to go in different seasons so we had to do multiple trips for the same sequences um but yeah it was it was sort of a, a, a vast number of um cameramen and scientists i mean we were the number of scientists around the world we collaborated with as well was was huge so um it was a it was an epic undertaking i think is the best way to phrase it <laughs> I can definitely agree. It looks very epic and uh, the time put into it is also very epic. And uh, the BBC's last series about the plant world was over 20 years ago. How did you, the new filmmaking technology and science help you tell new stories and capture new behaviour? Um, well, I think since that series was made, I think most filming technology that we use for wildlife filmmaking has advanced leaps and bounds. Um, you can now move the camera in many, many different ways in, in, in the natural world, but time-lapse photography, filming plants have not advanced nearly as fast, but we knew that making this series, we needed some big technological breakthrough to give people a new view of the plant world. And one of our team found um, a, an ex-military engineer in the States who had been inspired by watching a series called Planet Earth to build his own robotics time-lapse equipment in his basement, just for fun, just as a hobby. And we saw a clip of what he was doing and we thought, this is amazing. This is exactly what we need. And his system basically allows you to fly the camera through the plant world so that the shot is moving at the speed you might walk through a forest, but everything that's happening around you is in time-lapse. So it feels like you've crossed into this parallel plant world and you're seeing the plant world as the plants would see it on their time scale. And that's really revelatory. You feel you're seeing a, a completely different world. So we partnered with him for three years across the series and, and we built rigs that he, we, we developed the rigs he'd made in various different scales. So a big scale for studio filming, a smaller scale for field filming, and even smaller scale for macro filming. And that allowed us to fly this camera through the plant world and, and really reveal the plant world in a, in a new way. I think as a director, it also allowed us to think about filming plants in the way that we would normally film animals, because we had the capability to be able to put these moving shots onto our subject in a way that we normally think about, you know, when we go out to film a, a, a lion or whatever, um, you know, we, we suddenly were able to a, apply a similar style of filming and therefore a similar style of storytelling as well to our subjects, which um, really helped. And I think also in, in si the science around plants has de developed hugely over 25 years um, in a way that there is so much new science out there. And there's a language around plants as well, which is very much more uh, akin to how we talk about animals. So it, there was, it was just a really exciting um, set of stories that we found and a way that we were able to talk about those stories as well, which we've been able to bring into the programmes. So incredible to hear that great minds came together to create this incredible series. I think it's time for us to just have a look at um, a clip from episode two, which is called Water Worlds. It's a monster. It's well armed. It clears space for itself by wielding one of its buds like a club. And now it dominates the surface.
This is a leaf of the giant water lily. It expands by over 20 centimeters a day and eventually measures more than two meters across. As each one reaches the surface and expands, more and more light is taken from those plants that are trying to grow beneath. Competitors are pushed aside. Some are crushed or skewered. Eventually, its immense leaves press their margins against one another, totally cutting off the light from the plants beneath them. The battle is over, and victory is total. Every time we see a snippet of an episode, I am always in awe of the incredible detail. I'm sure you are too, as I can see everyone is engaging and asking us questions. So moving along, Rosie, you produced episode three, which features South Africa. Can you tell us more about your experience in filming there and were there any unforgettable behind the scenes moments for you? Um, well, we had to include, like South Africa has such a, extraordinarily unique um, ecosystem. And so I, we had to include it. The, the problem was almost that there was too, there's too many plants species um, and there's so much science and new science. And um, we were talking to one scientist uh, who had studied and found uh, a new story, a new piece of science. And we went to film the story and it's, it's a plant called Ceraticarium. It's a very tall spindly like grass type plant and um, it's just an extraordinary plant in that it, it's got these seeds that it sort of holds aloft and these cups and they're little, little round seeds and when the winds blow it flicks them out in the summertime and it coincides the produce production of its seeds uh, to the same time that the dung beetles are active and um, it turned out that this plant has evolved to have seeds that perfectly mimic the, the poo of um, of antelope, Bontebok and Eland, and uh, they look identical. They're the same size, the same color, the same shape, but they also have the exact same smell and filming them was um, a, a fairly stinky business. <laughs> um, it was, uh, it, they, they really had this pungent odor and the dung beetles would come in and then the, the seeds almost make the beetles do the work for them and the beetles roll away the seeds and bury them underground to the exact right depth for germination and it was just it was a, a really extraordinary um sequence to actually see as well to, to actually be there and, and see it was um a very amusing thing so incredible to hear that now uh, in episode three the team formed a fire in the western cape which awakened a beautiful bright orange fire lily which was underground for all those years now i believe this has never been filmed before 
you'll see on the screen some incredible pictures from this sequence. And Rosie, this must have been a powerful moment for you. How did you manage to film the sequence and what can you tell us about it? Um, so yeah, this was a, a real, um, well, we kept our fingers crossed and, and hoped <laughs> type of sequence because um, we, we heard about the fire lily, but it's so rare to see uh, that nobody really knew where we would be able to find them. So we, and we wanted to film the whole sequence from the, the fame boss in full bloom and with all of its flowers out and all of the competition that's involved in that because there's so many different species all competing for pollinators. Um, but then obviously the fires come through and um, you know the, the fame boss is reliant on the fire, but then the fire lily waits for its moment so it doesn't have to compete with all the other plants and it rises up out of the ashes about four days after a fire has passed through and then it blooms and it gets pollinated and then it goes back down underground wait to wait until another fire and what we needed was a, a huge network of of people and the collaboration between the the landowners and the scientists and all uh, you know we worked with um fire uh, various different fire organizations um, in order to, to be able to capture all the different parts of that story. And um, it was, it's a really emotional piece. And the, and the, the, the flowers that we actually found, the, the landowner didn't even know he had them on his land because they'd been underground for 15 years. And um, it was, yeah, I mean, we were very lucky to find them, but it was extraordinary to be able to see these sort of little pops of red against a completely charred landscape. Sure, 15 years is a very long time. And you also mentioned that there's quite a lot of science involved. Can you tell us more about other key moments that viewers can expect to see in this episode? Uh, well, the seasonal world, it transpired as I, <laughs> over the four years of making this film, is full of um, risk takers and opportunists because everything has to get their timing right. And they've all got these very small windows of opportunity. And um, so there's a lot of fraudsters a bit like the, the uh, Ceratocarium and the Dung Beetle, you know, there's con artists and, um, but there's an extraordinary um, sequence about the mycorrhizal network, which is a fungal network that's underneath the forests, connecting trees together, allowing trees of the seasonal world to communicate with each other and send resources to each other. And um, that I still find completely mind blowing. Lovely. As you can see, I've got a big smile on my face because episode three is one of my favorite episodes, more especially because you did shoot that and it features in South Africa. So I hope that everyone is setting their reminders as it will air on BBC Earth, DSTV channel 184 on Sunday, the 27th of February at 4 p.m. sharp. Now, before we move on, on to our audience questions, I'd love to hear from you both what you would like South African viewers to take away from watching The Green Planet. Um, I think one, one of the things, I, mean, I think we sort of take the importance of plants as a given now. I think that's something that people really do understand. I think it's this idea that plants are individuals and they've got all their own struggles uh, just as animals do. So plants are not things just to chop down and to push aside. They are individuals struggling um, to reproduce, to feed, um, to protect their young. And I think that sense that this natural world around us, this green world around us, is this dynamic world. It just operates on a different time scale. It's like it's a kind of a revelation. And I think if people take that away and have a different view, a different sensitivity to the green world, that would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just have, having an awareness of, of the natural world around them and, and looking at things that they thought they knew, or but actually so, to suddenly have a completely new understanding of, of what the struggles of that plant that they walk past every day um, actually is. And, and the importance of that on a, on a sort of a global scale and the importance to protect them. Oh, amazing. So let's move on to our audience questions. Uh, the first one is from Genevieve and it's posed at Rosie. Hi Rosie. Who were a couple of the South Africans who made an important contribution to the Seasonal Worlds episode? Oh, uh, that's a good question. Um, well, in the in the making of episode, actually, the, there's a whole um, part in, in that making of episode about how we filmed the fires and the importance of um, conservation in that because because climate change is affecting the fires in South Africa um, in quite a bad way and we felt it was really important to look at that 
facts and address it. And um, one of the main scientists that we worked with who appears in that is called Jasper Slingsby. Um, and he was quite critical. Another one who doesn't appear, but was very key in um, us getting uh, the the science right was a, a man called Rupert Koopman. And um, they were really key to us being able to understand the processes. All right, we have another question from Anonymous and it's posed at Rupert. Hi Rupert, which footage it took the longest to capture? Um, I think it would have been in the desert film, which is the fourth episode. And there's a scene where you see saguaro cacti, the classic tall cacti with big arms stretching out. Um, and when it rains, which it does rarely in the desert, they have this root network which can suck up huge amounts of water and store it in their stems. And the stem is sort of pleated, and when they're taking water, the pleats flatten out, so the stem increases in size. Um, but that's a very, very slow process. Um, so our team set up um, long-term time-lapse cameras on some cacti in Arizona, and the cameras ran for three years to get this uh, view of the cacti expanding, and then as they use the water contracting, and then expanding again. So three years for that shot. I think we have another one from Anonymous, and I think it's for both of you. What was your favorite moment from the series? Rosie, what was your favorite moment? Um, well, I, I think my favorite moment slightly uh, comes from um, the, my favorite shoot, what, the, the shoot that I loved the most, and that was the giant sequoias in California, where we, we took David, um, and it's just such a magical forest. The trees there are, they're vast. They're 11 meters across, 100 meters high. They're 3000 years old. And there's just such this, this sort of really sort of calming effect of being in that forest, but, um, but also those trees are under threat. So it was a, a really sort of sobering moment to film there, but a, a very um, magical one as well. Thank you for that. You know, as you mentioning the name of the plants, I'm thinking when I start watching this at 4 p.m. on Sunday the 13th, I must make sure I've got a notepad to start writing down the names so that I can Google them at the latest stage. So you're right, I'm noting this down. Another question from Genevieve. Hi, Rupert. How big was the research team and how long did it take to put together everything you need to brief your episode producers? Um, I suppose we researched initially probably for somewhere between eight months and a year, and that would have been three or four researchers talking to scientists, reading scientific papers and books, talking to naturalists, trying to find stories um, that would work on camera. Um, but then the producers joined the team sometime within that period and they started work as well. And I think it's an evolution, really. Um, I think the films kept evolving. We kept finding new stories all the way through. So you could say the research probably happened over about three years, in fact, um, and the producers were constantly working on their films to find new stories because something hadn't worked out or something just wasn't quite visual enough. So it, it's a very continuous process, but yeah, all, all stages of that research process continued, I'd say, for a good three years. Takes quite some time, hey? <laughs> um, we've got another question from Anesu. I'd love to know how the local communities surrounding the shoot locations respond to the project while it's underway. Um, I'm sure Rosie could talk about this as well. I, mean, I think when we go on location, we rely entirely upon local people to help us. Um, that you often have um, great experts in the natural environment living locally. So you, you want to work with a local team who can help you find what you want to film, who can help you with a lot of practical um, matters. Um, so I think embedding ourselves within the local community is a really key part of what we do. All right, we've got another question from Genevieve. At this point, I think Genevieve is going to feature in the next series. Um, she's got another question for Rupert. Hi, Rupert. Can you tell us a little bit about putting the sound effect in the green planet? Yes. Well, we're very lucky across the series. We had them as a brilliant uh, British sound recorder it's called Chris Watson, and he's very, very inventive. And what he loves doing is recording sounds that are very, very difficult to record, such as plant sounds. And he has all sorts of very strange um, microphones and, and listening systems, things like needles, which are put in, into a plant so you can hear what's going on inside the plant. And I remember the very first sound he sent to me was this weird thing. It sounded like something sort of rattling, straining. He hadn't told me what it was. He just said, have a listen to this. Um, and what it was, was a root, a tree's root, which he plugged into during a storm. And you could, once you knew that, you could sense that this tree root was just trying to hold on to the soil and not be pulled out by the storm. 
So we brought Chris onto the series and he traveled around with us and he did a lot of sound recordings of the plant world using all his very clever equipment to really give us a sense of what the world sounds like. If plants had ears, what it would sound like to a plant rather than what it sounds like to us. Mm -hmm. I can really hear that a lot of detail has gone into this. I mean, the visuals, the sounds, and everyone has already seen from just the snippet of the episodes that we've got a lot that we're signing up for here. It's going to be incredible. And we've got another question from Anonymous. What were some of your filming firsts? Um, I'm not, I could start bored until Rosie's got some specifics, but I mean, I would say almost every time you put a time-lapse camera on a plant, that's a filming first because it's probably never been filmed in time-lapse. So for example, the clip we just saw with the giant water lily, which comes up to the surface and crushes all the other plants in South America. There's a moment where you see the bud, like a sort of a mace, a sort of spiky lump comes up and then it swings around on the water surface, clearing a space. And we were working with um, the world's leading experts on giant water lilies, and they had no idea this plant did that, the sort of active clearing of the water surface so it had a place to unfurl. And I think there were many, many examples like that where you see the results of the time that shot and you thought, we had no idea a plant did that. Mm. Well, we've got a question here. Um, all right, the research team was four or five people and it took the research. Okay, this is, is this the response? I'm just double checking. All right, we have to see if there's other questions. Okay, I think that's it. I don't think we have any more questions from our audience. Um, okay, I've got one more over here. And it's from, sorry if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly. It's from Thanos and it says, were there things, events or areas you captured that as producers, you thought in another 25 years, this will no longer be possible to do or exist. Rosie, what do you think? Um, I, don't, I don't think there was a specific plant that I thought that about, but while I was filming the seasonal film, our biggest challenge by quite a long way was actually the predictability of the seasons. And we found that seasons across the whole temperate world just aren't doing what they're meant to be doing uh, reliably anymore. And, um, and I did, I, I often felt throughout the course of the, the two or three years filming that, you know, we struggle with small changes in temperature, but, but plants sort of rely on temperature as, as their cue. And, um, and so a lot of plants were sort of getting their timing wrong and they rely on getting their timing right to be successful. So I, I definitely did feel that um, the, the change in the seasons are, are going to impact plants in, in one way or other. And some will probably maybe do okay from it, but, uh, but there will be a lot that just won't be able to survive that. Okay, another one from Anonymous. Were you surprised by the plants you found and the unique characteristics? I think we were, and Rosie, I'm sure you have that again in your film, lots of surprises. Yeah, I, I think um, I, I was just constantly amazed, and I, I know it sounds silly, but, um, you know, it, I'd sort of find out one thing about a plant, and then we'd be like, oh, yeah, okay, this sounds great, let's go and film this, and then you go and film it, and then you'd realize, you know, you'd find out 10 more new things across the course of your three weeks of filming it, you'd, you'd find out, you know, a whole bunch of more things, you'd be like, oh, wow, it does this and it does this, and it does this, and it does this. And you think, God, we can't tell all of these things in, in the sequence that, in our film. But um, yeah, I was constantly amazed. At, uh, you know, the, the fact that there's a plant in the UK that we filmed called the Dodder that's able to smell its prey. So it's, it's a parasitic vine and it, 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 it smell, it sniffs out nettles because it wants to lock up, you know, twirl around the, the stem of a nettle and, and pierce into it to steal its nutrients. But it's able to smell to, to find those, those host pl plants. And that, I just, you know, just things like that are just amazing, I think. And uh, what was it like working closely to Sir David? Um, well, yes, I, mean, I, I think probably we both feel the same. I mean, it's a privilege to work with, with David. Um, he's on the one hand, he's, he's the most professional person you'll ever work with. If you're called time in the morning, it's 5 a.m. You know that Dave will be there at quarter to 5 a.m. So absolute professional in what he does. 
Um, but I think one thing we love about working with David is that he just wants to be part of the team. He's a, he's a global figure, but he's got no airs and graces. You go on location with him, he wants to be one of you. And you, he's aged, well, he's 95 now. You have to stop him picking up the heaviest piece of filming kit and trying to help you drag it through the rainforest. I mean, he just wants to be, he wants to get stuck in. So you just feel he's part of a team. But then when you turn the camera on David, you realize that he's not like you at all. He is this extraordinary communicator who has this great depth of knowledge and it's amazing passion for the subject and when he talks he's just magnetic so yeah it's, it's wonderful working with David. I yeah. think I also I really loved um, on this series in particular I mean he always has enthusiasm and excitement for something but on this series in particular the the, the boyish enthusiasm and excitement at learning about what these plants can do was just um, it, it was so infectious and it just sort of ran through the team and it was just it was really lovely to see that even at his age, he could still get that excited about, about something. Lovely. I'm getting more excited as we get closer to this uh, final launch show on the 13th. So I've got a question here from Anonymous. Why did you choose to film in South Africa? Well, I chose to film in South Africa because I, I couldn't possibly not film in South Africa. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, the Cape Floristic region is such a unique uh, ecosystem and environment, and um, it's, it's so biodiverse, and it's got such a unique um, identity to it uh, that I, I really felt that we had to include it. And there were so many exciting new stories that came out of there, I, I really could not. I should also mention, actually, I think that there's South Africa is featured in the deserts episode as well. Um, there's some exciting stories in the deserts episode in South Africa. Okay, that's incredible. We're really looking forward to it. I can already feel the energy through the screens. We have another question from Anonymous. How do you protect the species of plants when some communities use them for medicinal purposes? Um, I mean, I think in the process of making the series, I don't think that's that's an issue we came across, actually. So it's, to be honest, it's a little bit difficult for us to answer that. I think it's probably more of an ecologist's question than it is a filmmaker's question. Okay, thank you for that. And then from uh, Thinus, we've got the last question. They say never work with babies or animals as producers. Were there times it didn't work to talk to the plants and they didn't do quite what you expected? Right. <laughs> uh, all the time. <laughs> um, I think, um, I mean, we, we worked with um, a cameraman called Tim Shepard, who uh, is, you know, he's the most green fingered cameraman in the world, I think he's the best. And, you know, he would set up shots and, and leave them to run time lapses. And some of those time lapses might take six months and, you know, you get five months through it and realize that it, it hadn't worked and you'd have to start again. Um, but, it, you know, it was also a slightly different challenge. We had to take a new approach because, because plants, you know, unless you're, if you're not filming them in time lapse, they don't move, they're, they're static. So we really had to think about how to bring those, those plants and those characters to life. But yeah, often they, they didn't quite do what you needed them to do or grow in the way that you needed them to grow. So it was a challenge. I can imagine it must have taken a lot of patience as well. Um, but that also is exuded in your passion, you know. So I think this has been such an incredible launch. I'm looking forward to the series. I'm already, I've got my reminders set. And we do have to close the show that was, oh, I think we might have. Okay, we don't have any other question. We are now closing off. And I'd just like to say to both of you, Rupert and Rosie, thank you so, so much for bringing this to our screens. And a huge thank you as well to our guests for tuning into this virtual launch and engaging with us throughout. But before we go, I'd like to end off on a special message from Sir David Attenborough to close today's event. Stay safe, everyone. Please choose kindness and make sure to tune into The Green Planet on DSTV channel 184 on Sunday, the 13th of February at 4 p.m. sharp. Thank you so much for having me as your host. Have a lovely day. The world has suddenly become plant conscious. There, there has been a... Uh, revolution in worldwide in attitude to the natural world in my lifetime. An awakening uh, 
awareness of how important the natural world is to us all, an awareness that we would starve without plants. And we would literally, we wouldn't be able to breathe without plants. Uh, the world is green. It's uh, not a, I mean, it's an apt name. And yet people's understanding about plants has not kept up with that. I think this will bring it home. Join me in a world that takes you by surprise. <laughs>